Hello and welcome to another comedian's interview for my blog A Rich Comic Life. My name is Richard Gill and my blog describes my experiences of watching over 800 comedians and counting over the last 46 years. I'm delighted to welcome my special guest today, one of my favourite comedians, it's Mr. Justin Moorehouse. Yes! Ooh. Hello mate! <laughs> How are Richard, you? are you all right? Are you all right? Very well, thank you. Yeah, very excited to be uh, one of your uh, thousands of comedians. <laughs> well, thank you so much for doing this. Your um, rich comic life. Yes, it, indeed it is. Um, thank you so much. It's going to be uh, a, a, an interview about your comic career. And right. I'd and I'd like to start by going way back and asking you, how did you become a comedian? Well, um... <laughs> Uh, like you, I grew up loving comedy and uh, loved, absolutely loved comedy. And um, it always surprises me when people don't like comedy. I always think, well, what, what, are, what are these people? So, love comedy, grew up watching uh, Cannonball yeah. and um, the two Ronnies were a big favourite in with me. And then that led into, and I got a bit older, into things like The Young Ones and the alternative comedy and OTT and and drop the dead donkey and you know everything loved loved comedy loved it adored adored comedy um and me and all my mates are funny you know everyone's funny uh, you know people always think that you've got to be the are you the funny one in, in with your mates and like no i'm not i'm probably <laughs> the one who'll go a bit further than the others do you know what i mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably the one who will take the joke a bit too far um <laughs> Like, like, we booked a little holiday, um, uh, me and a couple of pals, to go to Malaga in October. Yeah. And um, one of the lads has paid for the flights. So we've sent him the money, and I wrote, when I sent him the money on the on the bank reference, I put uh, sexy time as the reference. <laughs> and then he, uh, he, he said, uh, he goes, oh, yeah, you know, you know, the, you know, the wife does my online banking. Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the next lad, the next lad hears this, and so he sends ball bags. <laughs> and he says that is, and then I just thought, oh. So then I just sent him another pound. <laughs> I sent him another pound, and then I wrote cum guzzler on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, I've probably gone a bit too far there, haven't I? I've probably pushed it, Brilliant. but I mean, you get away with it if you're a comedian, <laughs> so you're all right. So, so I loved um, comedy. I loved it, and uh, I used to go and watch a lot of comedy. I used yeah. to go to the Frog and Bucket and to the. Um, the, the bus club in Charlton in Manchester. Yeah. And there was a bit of a kind of, um, uh, not a groupie, but I really liked uh, Johnny Vegas and I really liked Brilliant. Peter Kay. Yeah. And I also liked, uh, at the time, acts like Alex Boardman and Steve Harris and people like that Superb. who are, who are yeah, yeah. friends now. You know, and I loved comedy and I, I saw Caroline I heard a couple of times. Oh, and, mate. And I saw, you know, people that I know now, like Tim Vine and... Yeah. Martin Sohn and yeah, uh, yeah. you know that and, and the, the buzz, especially the buzz, they used to have a lot of uh, variety acts on and you know alternative cabaret stuff and loved it and I loved the Frog and Bucket and we used to go I used to go and watch comedy gig you know once or twice a month at least you know and it never occurred to me that I could be a comedian I never I mean I was so naive I remember watching the show once at the uh, at the Frog and Dominic Carroll was comparing Dom Carroll yeah. And I noticed that when he uh, had finished comparing, he went to the bar and he got himself a drink. He went and poured himself a drink. I don't know. I, I mean, at the time, I thought, oh, he must be the manager of the place. And he just gets up and does a bit of MC. I, I, I was the same as most people. I didn't know anything about comedy. So I had a job at the time. I was 29 and I used to, um, I was a travelling salesman. I was like, look, well, say travelling, but around Manchester. And, and I didn't I didn't like my work. I didn't enjoy it. And it was quite frustrated with it. So right. I I, uh, I was listening to the radio and there's a comedian being interviewed on Five Live and I just thought to myself, how how would you be a comedian? I wonder how you'd become a comedian. So I rang up my local comedy club, which was the Frog and Bucket, and yeah. I said, how would you become a comedian? And they said, you need to have balls of steel. That's what they said. And <laughs> we have these Monday nights where you can come and try stuff. So I went down, this was in 1999. I went down there, uh, they booked me in for like three weeks uh, after I rang. Right. I had to go and have five minutes and it took me three weeks to come up with some ideas and and stuff. And I, I made the mistake of telling one person at work what I was going to be doing. And then the next thing you know, there's about 40 from work have turned up 
on this Monday night amateur night. And uh, <laughs> I have to say, the first night was absolutely stunning. Right. I think I think if you speak to comedians, they'll tell you that their first gig was either horrific or it was wonderful. I don't think anything <laughs> in between gets mentioned very often because, you know, how would you do that? So then I went back the week after full of confidence and died like I've never oh, died right. since. Because I was cocky and I remember I had chewing gum. I was just like, <laughs> thinking I knew that. I just <laughs> collapsed. And I went back the week afterwards because I thought, well, I've had a good one and a bad one. And I went back the week after and it was all right. And it was, I'd learned lessons and everything else. And and I say this, I've said this a number of times now, but I'd been doing comedy three times. And in my head, that meant I was a comedian. Yeah. And I thought, how do you give up? <laughs> so I just, I just did it for uh, about a year and worked full time. I did about 250 shows in my first year. and. Wow full-time job and I had a little baby and uh, and everything else and um, yeah it went it went really well really quickly and I have to say and I, and, and I don't mind saying this I got a couple of really good lucky breaks early on but like always if you get the breaks you've got to take them you've got the opportunity yeah you need to do something with it so within the first year of being a stand-up I got a part in Phoenix Nights and I won the uh, City Live Comedian of the Year. Brilliant. And I got, and that was being held at the brand new Comedy Store in Manchester. And that night, I won it. That night, um, I got representation from the Comedy Store. And I started getting booked at the Comedy Store within a year of being a comic. So it was in, incredible. Yeah. Whilst filming a TV show. <laughs> so, I mean, Fantastic. I was very, very lucky. I, I've had a, a go at stand-up comedy myself. Uh, mm -hmm. I I um, wanted to get it out in my system, and I went to the I, I go to the Edinburgh Festival every year, and I know yeah. the, I know I know the guy who runs the Free Fringe, and he and he said to me I can put you on uh, a gong show in the Haymarket uh, on a <laughs> Monday afternoon, which is for old folk. <laughs> so I wrote this script about me being accident prone driving around Carlisle and he loved yeah. it and he said right he said go and knock him dead so I walked out there was three of them in the audience and the first thing I, th I thought of saying and I did say was um, ladies and gentlemen uh, people think I look like Eddie the Eagle Edwards but I can't see the resemblance myself and of course I'm his double and yeah. one bloke at the back just went fuck off and gung me off <laughs> and I walked up to my foot on footprints and the guy said, have another go, have another go. So I had another go, <clears throat> same thing happened. And I said, I don't know about actually being a comedian, never say never again, but I no. will support all these heroes forevermore. And that's why. Well, you've got an them. itch that needs scratching, you know. Then you've got to be, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I always think, Rich, the world is full of could have been and would have been and should have been. Exactly. Well, you might as well have had a go. Exactly. So I had a yeah. go and then my blog and the blog's taken off. Well, you love comedy, don't you? Oh, absolutely. My, my first. Uh, first comedians I ever saw were Tommy Cooper on holiday in Scarborough in yeah. 1977, and then I saw Les Dawson, and he, those two, along with Markham and Wise, who I'd love to have seen, yeah. and they're my three favourites. I'd put Ken yeah. Dodd up there and a few others, Billy Connolly and the rest of them, but Les Dawson, and I know Les Dawson was a specialist subject for you on Celebrity yeah. Mastermind. Yeah, I mean, I was a big Les Dawson fan before I was a comedian, not yeah. just not just as a comedian, as a person. I thought, oh, he was brilliant. Know, I, I thought he was a tremendous person. I thought so many hidden depths and yeah. so, such intelligence and warmth yeah. and... Um, Look, very 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 funny man very talented mm. comedian he was brilliant mm. i saw him we saw him do his his um solo show in scarborough and he was brilliant but i also saw him uh starring in a in a not very good farce called run for your wife and it was one run of the last wife, things yeah. he did and in the cast was jan hunt and gordon honeycomb which yeah was amazing and he walked yeah, I, on I, I read and, about I, I read about that a lot because yeah. obviously did the research i've got on me I've got all me, uh, me sort of, um, oh, they're over there actually. I've got all me, uh, me, uh, Les Dawson books over right, there. Right. He's a and, massive and hero. He came on and he knew the play wasn't very good and he did like 15 minutes stand up before he did it. And there was a woman <laughs> with a baby next to me. The baby was crying and he jumped down, went up to the ba baby and he said, I don't want that, I want that. And the baby stopped crying. It was yeah. unbelievable. And I met his wife. And she burst into tears and she said that was less. Anyway, yeah. wonderful, wonderful memories. Um, 
to date, what has been your worst experience at a comedy gig? <sighs> Have you got any? I can't imagine. Yeah, yeah, any. yeah. I mean, sort of a personal level, there's been a couple where I've not had a good time, but um, I did a show in Chester about two years ago and uh, I was really enjoying it. I was really enjoying the show and uh, some uh, some guy had a seizure on the front row. Oh, mate. Yeah, and uh, like and passed out and was and and sort of like fell under the stage and uh i mean i think he's he's, he's oh well i know he did yeah he survived yeah. but i just thought to myself if this guy dies then i've killed him yeah. you know my, my actions are what cost him i mean if he i like to think that i laughed him into a seizure you know yeah, got him, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, but that was right. such a weird experience of trying to stop the show and and get him um get him out and get him recovered and, yeah, yeah. and everything else that was that was kind of strange i mean that was a a bad experience i've been i've been in audiences as well where you know they just turned they've just been a bit nasty and not i don't mean they don't like the comedy or they've heckled because you can put up with any of that yeah. but it's just there's a there's an undercurrent of um latent violence and you know there's some you know sometimes you'll you, they're, they're, somebody will have with the best intention will put a gig on and it should never have been on in this place yeah, you know yeah. you know the local sort of edl kind of people are in there and you know i i did a preview <laughs> i'll tell you this is a funny one i did a preview once in in huddersfield uh, a bar called the peacock lounge right and it was um a burlesque bar <laughs> and uh <laughs> And I, I stood on the burlesque stage doing this preview of a show, which was all right. You know, it was a new show and I was getting it ready for Edinburgh. So, I mean, it was going to be stoppy, starty and, you know, that sort of thing. You've seen enough previews to know what what that is. Yeah, yeah. And I looked there and the window was open. The, the sort of curtains to the burlesque bar were open to me and there was only about 20 people in. And I said something along the lines of, if I ran the burlesque bar, the last thing I'd want is this to be the window display <laughs> right which is quite funny and everything else this bloke just started going <laughs> <laughs> but i'm like that's not part of the show mate that's me just making an observation anyway <laughs> i look over into the corner and there's a blind woman right comforting a man who's crying right right <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's fully blind. She's got the full, you know, wrap round shades on. Ray Davis, not Ray Davis. Yeah, um, what's he called? Ray Davis, not Ray Davis. Ray, Ray uh, Bradshaw. No, not Ray Bradshaw. Piano player, American soul singer. Ray, oh, uh... <laughs> I can't believe I can't think of this. What's he called? Not Ray Davis. Ray. No, Ray Davis is in, is in the uh, Kinks, isn't he? Yeah, Ray. Ray. I can't believe What's he can't he called? Remember. I'm gonna to have to look it up oh, then because that is so embarrassing. I'm gonna look it up now. Ray. There's a film about him in there, Ray. Um Yeah, Ray, Ray with um Ray Charles. Ray Charles. Ray Charles. Of course. Not Ray yeah, Bradshaw. So... <laughs> <laughs> At one point I nearly said Lord Charles. It wasn't it. <laughs> but Ray Charles, there's a woman with the Ray Charles glasses on, and there's a bloke. And they're both sort of in their 50s and that. And he's sobbing, sobbing, mate. And she's comforting him. <laughs> and I just thought, this is the weirdest, this is the weirdest gig I've ever done. <laughs> so she's sobbing, he's comfort uh, he's sobbing, she's comforting him. <laughs> These blokes applauding me like this. I said all this, I'm doing my stuff. And then one of my anecdotes was about how Harold Shipman uh, used to be our family doctor, our local doctor where we lived, and I got these little stories about him. And as soon as I said that, this bloke stood up on his own, right? Nobody else did this. He stood up on his own and he went, Shipman is our hero. Oh, no. Shipman is our hero. He kills oh. the Manx. He kills the Manx. Shipman is. And he did it three times. Oh, mate. And I just went, I'm, I'm going. <laughs> But the problem was I had loads of props and daft things and I had to, oh. I was packing my bag and everything else. And you know what? That's the only time that people have ever commented about a performance I've done on, on a yeah, comedy yeah. website called Chortle. They went on and sort of like made complaints. I was like, oh, mate. it was a preview. And yeah. you know, the problem was it had been in the um, pick of the day in the Sunday Times or something <laughs> like that. It was just weird. Just like, That's bizarre. 
And you know, normally, like, normally I can't wait to get there. I love doing gigs. Yeah. Sometimes you come off and you go, oh, I could have done better or whatever, but there's normally this kind of rush of a, uh, adrenaline and a high that you get after a gig. And when you have a bad one, it's just, honestly, it's soul crushing. I've no doubt, yeah. It must it's, be it's, awful. It, it, yeah, it's not the kind of, like, bad day at work stuff. It's your very existence is questioned. Yeah. Like, you are fucking useless. Yeah. I like, would never say that. No, no, but you think, but you think that at that time, you think, what the, what am I, because we all have imposter syndrome, Yeah. but you think, what am I, what am I doing here? What, what, they're right, of course they're right. They watch comedy, they know more than me. (laughs) And anyway, and then you have the good ones and, and you know, the good ones, I have more good ones than bad ones, definitely. So, you know. But you, whenever I've seen you, you have a very, very warm, endearing personality, which helps enormously on stage Mm -hmm. to engage with an audience. Yeah, I I think so. I think I think we're all an exaggeration of ourselves when we're stand up comedians. And I think um, I like to think that I communicate with an audience as well as just stand there and tell them jokes. I, I always see it as a kind of part i always this is going to sound quite uh wanky but i always feel like it's part conversation and even though they don't talk back to me the way they react informs how i speak back to them and everything else i think it's part conversation and i also think it's it's part like you orchestrate an audience the way you play an audience you might they need to get a bit more of that and i'm not getting enough these kind of laughs so i need to bring that bit up and and that sort of stuff and then when it's going really well when it's going really well you're you're on some kind of autopilot because you know what you're talking about and what you're doing is you're thinking how can i lift this now to the next level because this audience are ready for more than what i've got they're ready for more than the standard stuff and it's just that sort of stuff when it when 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 it's when it's brilliant it's transcendental it's and for the for, for for an audience as much as you it's kind of you know yourself when you've been in uh, gigs where the unexpected's happened yeah. or something odd's happened, where it's that once in a moment, once in a lifetime moment, you had to be there, kind of exciting thing. And those moments are, and if you can weave something from it, you know, I mean, you've seen enough gigs now to know when people are bullshitting. You yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're the craziest audience I've ever had, are you? Because I saw you last week and you said that in exactly this moment, you know. <laughs> you know, I, you know what I ate? I ate, the, I ate the false mistake. You know, the false corpse. Yeah. You know, and they said, I think, well, of course, not that exactly. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> think, oh. It just doesn't work, does it? And nobody in any audience has ever thought anybody was the bastard love child of somebody and somebody <laughs> nobody's ever thought that no one's i know what you're thinking i'd love to be a, i'd love to be an anonymous audience member once and just when comedians are on this is one of my favorites when they say uh, it's good that one isn't it i took the rest of the week up rest of the day off when i wrote that and i want to shout i'd have carried on writing mate you're in an unusual rich vein of form <laughs> <laughs> you perhaps could have lifted yourself from here and done better than that that's brilliant <laughs> I took the rest of the day off. You, you were on fire, mate. You, you know, <laughs> you know Dolly Parton wrote "I Will Always Love You" and Jolene on the same day. Right, I didn't know that. <laughs> on the same day. So if she could do that, you could write another one of those jokes. That's all right. <laughs> um, you you mentioned earlier that you. Uh, um, have been many times to the comedy store and I've seen you both in Manchester and in London um, mm-hmm. you're, uh, you're a regular compare there uh, do you prefer comparing to stand up routines I prefer doing stand up I prefer yeah. just going and doing a set because I'm in charge of everything else Yeah. Uh, but there's no greater thrill in this career this job than comparing the London Comedy Store. It's like being the captain of the England football team. It's, for, you know, I don't, there's not a better spot for a comedian to, to do. And, you know, and it's it's a magical place, the Comedy Store. Oh, it's you know, incredible. It's just, you know, it's yeah. just the atmosphere is electric and, 
you know, you can always, you, you know, and I, if you've seen me compare there, you know what I do. I, I keep the story going throughout the night. We start over here and we bring them into the story. And yeah. I love that. I, yeah. You know, I love that sort of stuff. I love, you know, I love being at the comedy store and looking over at the glass box where the sound is. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, just having a look at the sound man and just making him laugh and, you know, and, and me, you know, look, laughing back and that sort of stuff. Or him just going, oh my, Graham's going, oh my God, I can't believe you've done that. Because he's seen so much comedy because oh, he used to be the yeah. sound man at Jonglers in Battersea and then he was the sound man at the comedy stories. But just because they must get sick of seeing the same routines from the same people. So, well, it's a bit special. It's it's great. Yeah. You know, it's great. I've been going uh, there many, many years. My first comedy store in London was um, John Maloney compared it. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Gribbin was on. Linda Smith was on. Oh. Phil Jupiter was on. And the headliner was um, somebody called Charles Fleischer, who was an American comedian yeah, yeah. who did all these zany uh, facial expression yeah, yeah and he was never heard of again because he went to hollywood and he voiced roger rabbit so yeah yeah and you knew the extraordinary. name and i thought i love this place and yeah. i've been there so so many times over the years and i've seen you many times there um, yeah, is it your favorite yeah very much so it's my it's my well my favorite live comedy venue has got to be always be comedy now the one in kennington the one in kennington because uh, i was looking for a very small venue that resembled edinburgh and i yeah. went there and uh, it was just extraordinary that room but um certainly on a weekend we either go to the comedy store we go to headliners at chiswick yeah. we go to um the the banana cabaret at Ballum. Um, mm -hmm. And I miss all that big time. I hope it comes back very. It's very coming soon. back soon, mate. Yeah. It's coming back soon. Yeah. At the time of recording, we were living through the coronavirus pandemic. <laughs> In case anybody doesn't know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you suffer from any nerves before you go yeah. on stage, and how yeah. do you cope with them? I uh, all I have nerves every single day of my life. I live wow. my life on the edge. Um. It's, it's adrenaline. Me. It's not nerves. It's adrenaline. That's yeah. what it is. And uh, I'm always anxious before a gig. And that's just preparation, really. That's right. just, you know, stage fright. One person's stage fright is another person's adrenaline. And if I'm stood waiting to go on and I don't feel frightened, I suddenly start feeling frightened because I'm not frightened. Oh, if mate. you're not, you know, if you're not ready for it, then you're not ready for it. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm nerves. Yeah. I mean, I mean things like... Um, I've been lucky enough to do uh, some of the bigger gigs on television, the live at the Apollos and that sort of thing. And, you know, I get unusually nervous about those things. It's not, you know, they're not real because they're a TV show. They're yeah, not a yeah. gig. And I kind of, you know, if I didn't know there was cameras there, I'd love that experience of big room, 3,000 people for a comedian of my um, skill set. Of course. Uh, <laughs> it, th them gigs are easy. Them gigs yeah. are easy because... You know, we're used to trying to convince 100 people, 200 people, 400 people to, to like you. 3,000 people, if only 10% of them like you, that's like a full club. So then, them gigs are not hard. They just, they put so much pressure on you. You put so much pressure on yourself that, you know, I, I remember when I filmed the Live at the Apollo, I was halfway through a routine and I just dried. I just dried wow. up. Not, not ideas, literally, physically, in my mouth. Wow. And I said to the audience, I'm gonna have to stop here, I'm gonna have to go and get a drink. My oh, mouth's gone dry. I look like an idiot on the telly. And you know what? I think that helped me because the audience suddenly went, he's a great guy. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So I had the water and I went, oh, we can say what we want, what we like now, because yeah. this will never be on the telly. You know, like bullshit wanked, you know. <laughs> and then went back to it and the, the audience were great, you know. That that surprises me though because whenever I, again I've seen you on stage you're all, you always seem to be very very confident and Ooh. very easy going with the audience I think my my guess would be as soon as you start you know what you're doing and you're yeah. okay and definitely yeah 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 that's the thing it, you know uh, that's that's definitely the case that um, yeah as soon as as soon as the gig starts I'm, I'm I am all right okay. I'm fine I'm just yeah. you know. How do you remember all your jokes and routines? Have you got a way of remembering them? Well, most of my stuff's stories. Yeah. 
So I think uh, you tell the story from A to Z and yeah. you know where it's going because the story is kind of established and everything that I talk about is based on truth anyway. Every you know I don't uh, make any I don't make any scenarios up. I embellish stuff and polish it and take the rough edges off it. You know for comedic value. Yeah. But I don't you know I don't do any of those um, you know you know when you you know you had to you know those ones where people go didn't happen mate you know I, <laughs> it's, it's not my it's not my cup of tea. Again, you um, can tell the bullshit. <laughs> you can. You, I mean, I, the audiences can. You know what I mean? It's that. So, um, you know, I, I do that. And I think um, there's a natural rhythm to, to comedy and, uh, and yeah. a, a cadence and a, and a pattern to, to, to the where the punchlines come. So they help you through. I mean, occasionally you just, I mean, I've been, I've been doing our shows and I've been 45 minutes in and I've gone, ah, shit. I needed to tell you this bit earlier because in a moment I'm going to tell you something else. It's imperative <laughs> that you know that information, and that's happened occasionally. Yeah. But um, you know, normally when well writing a show, when I'm writing a new show, I um, I use notes a lot. So I, I'll um, I'm writing a new Edinburgh show. I use bullet points. So these, in fact, you can just probably for the purposes of us recording here, them books there. Yeah. yeah. Those are all the books. Those are all my shows. Wow! I've ever written. Wow! Um, wow! 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 Yeah. So, in fact, if I get one, just to read one out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. If you want, that's great. See, there's anything on it? Oh. Normally, they have a date on when I was doing the show or or whatever. Yeah, that's fantastic. What so, an archive! Uh, yeah. So Rochdale, the third of July, two thousand and ten. Brilliant. Uh, it was preview uh, 18 of 20 um, and the new stuff that I was doing uh, was um, uh, I, I, so the show the show is written down there down that side yeah and the, and the new bits I'm gonna try it on that side um, so I did so it just goes presume stand up ambition hide London dishwasher champagne bouncer doctor weight gym fair sportsman boxers tiger good to be here Bumming, <laughs> Isabel, <laughs> Disney, Mum Holidays, Boiled Egg. So it is just one word. One word, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's uh, amazing. And then yeah, from so that's, that, you'll you'll remember the routine and do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, there's some of these are just little ideas here: yeah. diet, gym, fairground, fridge joke, uh, bingo, hide factory, aspirations, nightclub bouncer, London gay. <laughs> I know what London Gay was. I know what London Gay was. It was about um, uh, how Anthony used to go. He's moved to London, you know, <laughs> which used to mean like, he's never married. He's moved to London. <laughs> so I just see how far this takes us to the. Uh... So then, uh, that, oh, this is interesting. Then there's a bit here where my mates come with me yeah. to London, and he's written little notes after he's watched it. Wow, it's amazing. <laughs> that's yeah. So that's that's eleven that's years old. That, book. that is incredible. Yeah, keep that. And then I've gone for every. Oops, I've gone for every show that. That is these brilliant. More, these were more. I think these ones here are more modern. These ones here. Right. Oh yeah, this is the Destiny Calling show. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw that yeah, one. Yeah. This is from two thousand and fifteen. There we go. <laughs> wow. Toddler James, cheese on toast, Tinchy, <laughs> Bronco, Bobby Dazzler, Ricky, three animals. <laughs> Marplant, Sutton Caulfield, hip toddler, ambition <laughs> achieve. I just it, this reminds me of how the things, how they, they change. The shows change. It's just like, yeah, it is amazing because because it's a it's yeah. a diary of your career. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, that's amazing. That is incredible. Yeah, and I don't look at them very often. No, um, no, no. But, but, so that's but that's what I do. That's why it's brilliant. So that's how I write them. That's how I write the shows by yeah. by by getting. So I'll do the comedy store, or I'll do headliners in Chiswick, or or the cult clubs of beer, or whatever. Yeah. And I'll work new bits into to routines. Yeah. So at the moment, I'm working on some stuff about my dad dying, <laughs> uh, but trying to make it funny. Yeah. And uh, so I'm working that into into the existing gigs, and then that'll become part of a show, and then that'll get its own little headline, and then. That's brilliant. I, I always think you need twenty bits. For, I need about twenty bits for an hour, and these right. bits three minutes long yeah. and each bit can start as one joke and then it'll you know I had things on the beginning and the end and I always like putting things I always like callbacks 
I like, especially in an hour show, I like an audience to think they've enjoyed it and they can see things coming and they enjoy the satisfaction of things being wrapped up. I mean, I'm not highfalutin, but no. I mean, if you see my Edinburgh shows, there's a point to them. Yeah. You know, there's a message, not a message message, but you know what I'm saying. It's not just an hour of me telling jokes. There's always a theme -ish. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's normally about my own demise. <laughs> 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 let's let's move on to Edinburgh because uh, I go there every year. I'm very lucky to go there. I first went there in 2005 mm -hmm. and I've been there uh, uh, every year since. I go and see about 50 shows in a week. I absolutely love it. And let me just give you a roll call of what I've seen you in. I first saw you, your solo show, Who's the Daddy, in 2007. Blimey. Ever, ever Decrease in Social Circles in 2008. Seven in mm -hmm. 2009. Boiled Egg on the Beach in 2010. This is What I Am in 2011. Destiny Calling in 2015. People and Feelings, 2017. And Northern Joker, 2018. Wow. So my question, which you've already answered, was describe your writing process. But how would you think of a new idea for a show? How do you get your ideas? Is it all about everyday life? Normally, um, it's what I'm writing about, and then you find a common thread. Yeah. Normally, something will 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 come, and there's a there's normally a, a a deadline to name a show and come up with some kind of stuff about that around about March time. So. Normally, um, what my normal process has been over the years, and it, it, it obviously not been for the last couple of years, is that I will write a new show, do it in the Edinburgh Fringe. So I'll do 25 previews, do it in the Edinburgh Fringe for 30 times, then take it on the road, try and do it 25, 30, 40 times, get that done for about this Christmas time, January time. And then actually what I've been doing now is doing another second leg of it Yes, and then taking yeah. a year off and doing Edinburgh the year after that, so so that's what I what I do and try not to do any new jokes in the old show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the old show always gets a bit bigger and and um, flabbier sometimes, and you have to trim it all back. But there's no point putting huge new bits into an old show because mm -hmm. you're doing that. So that's that's what I do, and I kind of voice note things or write things down or get some ideas or it's it's there's no kind of hard and fast way of doing it but that's that's what i do i'm i'm so you've been to more edinburgh shows of mine than i have <laughs> can i can it's, i just can i just say as well that uh, the, the friends of mine who i go with uh, maria my friend uh when she heard you say uh that your son was like a yawn in a hood that <laughs> line i've never she was she nearly had a heart attack laughing and yeah. she was laughing so hard and we were right at the back of the audience <laughs> and I'm thinking she, he's going to hear you as well as me laughing like yeah. so the you wordplay was absolutely perfect um, let's move on to Phoenix Nights please because, yeah, sure. um, because you in you famously played young Kenny in TV's Phoenix Nights alongside Peter Kay how did it come about because uh I'm such a massive Peter K fan, and the group that he got together for that was extraordinary, including yourself. How did it well, come about? Well, um, it was really early on in, in sort of me doing stand up, and um, a guy called Smug Roberts, who's um, he's, he's, he plays uh, Max's brother yeah. um, with the gun, the Brunals, and our mouse, or whatever it's called. Yeah. Uh, he was uh, pals with, with Peter, and uh, I wasn't really pals with Peter, and um, I went with Smug to watch Peter do this gig in a marquee uh, in in North Manchester. It was like a charity type of thing, and he was really good. And Peter was great. And I um, I got chatting to him afterwards, and I, and everybody knew he was doing this program because he'd done that Peter K thing. Everybody knew he was yeah. doing this thing, and I just said to him, I said, "Oh, I'd really like an audition. Could I, could I have an audition? Because I was dead keen on trying to find out." Um, what the audition process was, how you did that, you know, and, and everything else. And he said, uh, yeah, yeah, you can, because you're the only one who's asked for an audition. Everybody else <laughs> so it was really just a learning thing. And I went yeah. and um, uh, did the audition. And then Peter and the director said to me, could you do it this way, do it a different way? And then they went, can you do it the way you did it? And that's just to see whether you can take direction. That's yeah, what they yeah, yeah. do. Because there's none of us were trained actors. And what they needed was, they didn't want people who thought they knew it all. They needed people who could be directed. It was really funny, actually. When we 
when we filmed something, somebody would say, oh, that was really funny, let's do it again. And Peter would go, don't tell them it was funny. They'll never do it. They'll just try and be funny now. They don't know why it was funny. They'll just try and be, oh, <laughs> God, you've ruined it now. So um, so that was that. And, and, you know, and then he phoned me up uh, that night and said I got the part. It wow. was like, yeah, it's really good. I mean, if it wasn't for that, I don't think um, I'd be here talking to you today. Wow. Well, um, I, I first saw Peter Kay at the Jabez Clegg Club in Manchester years yeah. ago before he was famous. And he was on a bill of five acts and he came, he was fourth on and I laughed so hard at him. I missed the fifth act. And I said to yeah. my mate, he's going to be a superstar, this kid. And then Phoenix Nights came along and my favorite episode is the family fun day, especially yeah. with you with the face paint and yeah. that you couldn't get off. And then yeah. we saw, we saw Phoenix Nights live in 2015 for mm -hmm. comic relief. And you came on and you still had the first pins yeah. on. It was genius. It was so, so good. And there are so many clubs like that, uh, certainly in Carlisle, where I'm from, or the surrounding area, or northern <laughs> clubs. He just hit the nail on the head. It, we, I, we watch it time and time again. So yeah, thank definitely. you for being in it. It's oh, no. Wonderful. Thank him. Um, thank them. Yeah, but, but you were hilarious in it. You're also a successful radio DJ in Manchester. Mm. How did that come about? So in 2002, when the Olympic, uh, sorry, the Commonwealth Games were on in Manchester, and I'd been a comedian for a couple of years, uh, I got asked to what to do like this, what they call an RSL, you know, a restricted service license for that was at the BBC. So I used to do Saturday and Sundays, breakfast on there. And whilst I was doing that, funnily enough, actually, this funny how circles come round. There's a guy called Paul Coleman who was uh, one of Peter's best friends. Yeah. And he's one of the guys who created car share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bizarrely, yeah. later on. But at the time he worked in marketing at, at Key 103, which was the radio station. Right. And uh, he got in touch with me and said, oh, would you like, would you come in and speak to us? And uh, I went in and spoke to them and they gave me a Sunday morning show after the, the Commonwealth Games had finished. So I started doing Sunday mornings and then they gave me uh, the breakfast show on the gold station on, on Magic. So I did that for a bit. So I ended up working there for about 10 years. It was, uh, you know, a long, a long time. And it was, you know, I mean, partly I think I maybe have done a bit better in comedy if I'd not done it. But actually it suited, you know, my lifestyle at the time and having a, a young family, it was kind of, it, it worked out for me like that. Yes, of course. And then I went out and saw that when I lost the job, because I mean, you do, you, you, there's no bones about it, lost the job and, you know, budgets and new ch challenges. <laughs> You know, we thank him for his efforts and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. he's going on to do new challenges. Yeah. I was kind of a bit lost for a couple of years and I, uh, you know, and I think that's what I needed though, a, a kick up the backside to become a better comedian. And uh, I think I'm a better comedian, A, for having been on the radio for that long and I'm, no, A and B, for, for, for losing it. So you have to kind of go again and, and it reinvigorated my love of stand-up and we're, I'd forgotten about what I did and why I loved it and, and everything brilliant. else so it was good and now I do a bit on Radio Manchester I don't I only do a couple of shows a week but it's nice to keep your hand in it's nice yeah, to yeah, you know yeah. so it's a great medium and uh, you know I, I enjoyed meeting the guests and chatting to people and everything else and uh, that's, that's I mean and that's obviously um, also I also have a podcast as well which is you know a similar kind of thing so yeah, it's um, it's good fun. It's good fun. Who are your favourite comedians, past and present? Les Dawson, number one. Uh, it, was, it was magic. Yeah, it absolutely. Was Cannon and Ball. Yeah. I wasn't a massive Morecambe and Wise fan. I, I don't know why. Just I don't think we watched them as much in our house. Yeah. Love the two Ronnies. Yeah. I just love the two Ronnies. I love television comedy. I love sitcom. I loved. Yeah. Heidi High. Yeah, uh, yeah. I loved Heidi High. I loved Open All Hours. Um, I loved Last of the Summer Wine. I loved Drop the Dead Donkey. Really? I love yeah. sitcom. I love sitcom. Uh, Fresh Fields and French Fields yeah, and Man yeah. About the House and Three Up, Two Down. Yeah. Brush Strokes is a real favourite. Uh, John Sullivan stuff. I mean, I, Only Fills and Horses, I, I really like. I just think it's been done to death a little bit now. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, I love Dear John. I don't know if you've ever seen yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very much so, yeah. Yeah. Dear John. When you, when you mentioned... <laughs> When you mentioned Cannon and Ball, it was tragic that he passed on. But uh, we, yeah. went, we went to see them in pantomime 
with with my brother and his family and and my my nephew's called tommy so of course he was on my knee and he was going bananas with the thing yeah and afterwards they were in the pub and i went up to them i i wish i'd got a picture but i went up to yeah. them and i and i said oh, i've been fans for years and years and bobby ball just looked at me and grinned and he went we're still working cocker <laughs> <laughs> and it was just wonderful you know he was beaming that he was just still working it was great um, the reason why I say, uh, why I ask that, that question is that there's a section in my blog called The Ones That Got Away, and I've yeah. written 25 of them who are, have either not been able to see or have sadly passed on. And Bob Monkhouse, Dave Allen, Morecambe and Wise, Norman Wisdom, there's so many of them, and mm. all the blogs have so many memories for me, so, it's, so I like to ask the question. Um, just before we go, and thank you so much for your time, um, is there anything else you'd like to say? Have you got any online gigs coming up? If you want to mention your podcasts, any books? Podcast is good. People download it. If you want to join my mailing list, I've got a mailing list on my website, and you can stay in touch with everything that I do. I, I don't think I'm very good at the self-promotion. I need to probably be a bit better at it. But if there's anything else I'd like to say, I'd like to say thanks to you, Rich, and... Um, you know your enthusiasm for comedy you know is infectious and uh, your blog and you spreading the word if it wasn't for people like you who, who tell other people about comedy that we'd be in a much poorer state nobody i know has ever been to a comedy night and has gone oh it was a bit rubbish everybody goes to them and goes why have we not been doing this for years let's <laughs> let's do this more let's do this more nobody ever says oh i went to comedy didn't like it so it's good that there's people like you, like ambassadors, or as I like to call you, Rich, the ha 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 ambassador. <laughs> well, that's very, very kind of you to say. Um, and please keep doing what you do, because you're a very, very, very funny man who makes me Thanks, and man. many others laugh a lot. I'm telling you, mate. And I'm I'll try. For, I'm looking forward to seeing you again very, very soon. Just uh, where can people find you on social media? Everything is my name, Justin Morehouse. I'm on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and uh, probably on your drive as well. <laughs> well, all the very best to you, and I'll see you again soon. Thank you Cheers. so much.